Karen Doerr here from Faith Community Church. Welcome to our online midweek Bible study. You know, we're really winding down with this study from the book of Revelation. This week, we're going to be looking at the millennial reign of Christ as revealed in Revelation chapter 20. This chapter opens up for us the third part of our series entitled The Tribulation Before, During, and After. Revelation 20 introduces us to the events that will take place after the events of the seven years of tribulation, when Jesus comes back to establish his kingdom on earth. The term millennial reign or millennial kingdom is not used in the scriptures. It's a theological term that's used to define the thousand year period spoken of in the Bible, both in the Old and New Testaments. This time known as the millennial reign, or as I said, millennial kingdom, is referred to six times in the book of Revelation in chapter 20. It is the everlasting earthly kingdom that was promised to Israel, both in the Abrahamic and Davidic covenants. Now, you know, there are many who read the book of Revelation, skipping through parts here and there. But if you truly want to understand the fullness of this prophecy and what it means for us today, then it is vital to study it through and through from beginning to end, chapter by chapter and verse by verse. And this is what we've endeavored to do during this series. You see, only then can a student of God's word comprehend the weightiness of the Lord's warnings of his judgments to come. To a lost and dying world, it is God's solemn vow that he will right the wrongs that they have committed. Beloved, we are now living in a season of grace. Now is the time to seek and serve the Lord. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 16 tells us, let us with confidence then draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. As we study this book together, let's draw near to the throne of grace. You see, as I said, now is the time to come to the Lord. Now is the time to seek the Lord. And now is the time to serve the Lord. As we take this moment to pray before we get into our study, I want to encourage you, open up your heart. Ask the Lord to reveal himself to you as we go through the rest of this book, as we study Revelation together. Amen. Let's pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, we worship you and we honor you. Lord God, we just enter your gates with thanksgiving. We come into your courts with praise. We acknowledge that you are the most high God. You are the creator of heaven and earth. You are the greater and we are the lesser. Lord God, as we come toward the close of this book, we pray, Father God, that each and every one of us would receive the illumination of your truth as we study this book of Revelation. Holy Spirit, we welcome you into this meeting and we ask you, Lord God, open the eyes of our understanding that we may know you and be known by you. And we ask this all through Jesus Christ, our Lord, in his powerful name. Amen. Well, Revelation 20, as I said, marks a new beginning for all on the earth who refuse the mark of the beast, who refuse to bow down and worship his image. So let's begin by reading through the chapter, and then we're going to look at each verse one by one. We're in Revelation chapter 20, and here we're going to begin with verse 1. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding in his hand the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain. And he sees the dragon, that ancient serpent, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years and threw him into the pit and shut it and sealed it over him so that he might not deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years were ended. After that, he must be released for a little while. Then I saw thrones, and seated on them were those to whom the authority to judge was committed. 
Also, I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for the testimony of Jesus and for the word of God and those who had not worshiped the beast or its image and had not received its mark on their foreheads or on their hands. They came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is the one who shares in the first resurrection. Over such, the second death has no power, but they will be priests of God and of Christ, and they will reign with him for a thousand years. And when the thousand years are ended, Satan will be released from his prison and will come out to deceive the nations that are on the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them for battle. Their number is like the sand of the sea. And they marched up over the broad plain of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city. But fire came down from heaven and consumed them. And the devil who had deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur, where the beast and false prophet were. And there they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Now let's take a pause here and go back to take a closer look at the meaning of these verses. So let's read through verses one through three again. Then I, then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding in his hand the key to the bottomless pit in a great chain. And he seized the dragon, that ancient serpent, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years and threw him into the pit and shut it and sealed it over him so that he might not deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years were ended. After that, he must be released for a little while. Here in verse one, John begins to describe the next scene of the vision that he's given after witnessing the second coming of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, that was recorded in chapter 19, which we studied last week. He tells us here in chapter 20, that he saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding in his hand the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain. Now this angel seizes the dragon, who is the devil, throws him in a pit and binds him up for a thousand years. This is Christ's first order of business when he establishes his throne on the earth to bind up Satan so that he cannot deceive the nations of the earth for the next thousand years. The chain used to bind him in, is described in verse one as being great. And this speaks to the enormity of the restraint that will be placed upon the evil one during this time. Church, for 1,000 years, the enemy of our souls will be incapacitated. He will not be able to use his weapons of deceit, his weapons of deceptions against those that are on the earth during this time. Now, I know many people question, why is he bound for only a thousand years here and not bound forever? Well, we need to understand that the millennial kingdom will be the last age after the tribulation in which God deals with mankind on earth. You see, after the great tribulation, there will be those who survived God's judgments, who survived the battle of Armageddon. Those who did not take the mark of the beast, who escaped death and placed their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. These men and women, beloved, will still be living on earth in a mortal body. And the Bible teaches they're going to have very, very long lifespans, just like in the days of Noah. And we know this through the prophecies of Isaiah and Zechariah. For tonight, we're gonna to take a look at one of those prophecies. I'd like you to please hold your place in Revelation. And let's turn to the book of Zechariah. And we're gonna look at Zechariah chapter eight. And we're gonna be reading from verses three through six. So hold your place in Revelation, but let's go over to the Old Testament 
And let's take a look at what the prophet Zechariah had to say regarding this millennial kingdom. Zechariah chapter 8, we're going to begin reading from verse 3. Thus says the Lord, I have returned to Zion and will dwell in the midst of Jerusalem. And Jerusalem shall be called the faithful city and the mountain of the Lord of hosts, the holy mountain. Thus says the Lord of hosts, old men and old women shall again sit in the streets of Jerusalem, each with staff in hand because of great age. And the streets of the city shall be full of boys and girls playing in the streets Thus says the Lord of hosts, it is a marvelous, if it is a marvelous sight in the remnant of his people in those days, should it also be marvelous in my sight, declares the Lord of hosts. Now, beloved, this teaches us that during this time, people are going to be given in marriage and have children. And the population of the earth is going to explode. The population of the earth during the millennium is going to increase greatly, especially because people will have very long lifespans. People during the millennial age are going to live for hundreds and hundreds of years. Now, you have to understand in their mortal state, which these people are still in, these children being born and the people themselves are born into the world with a sin nature. And it is for this reason that Satan will be loosed after the thousand years to test the faithfulness of these people to the Lord. And it's after this final testing that we're going to enter into an eternal state with a new heaven and a new earth, which we're going to study in Revelation chapters 21 and 22 next week. Now the prophet Amos in Amos chapter nine, verses 11 through 15, tells us that the thousand years of the millennial kingdom are also gonna be years of great prosperity. It says, in that day, I will raise up the booth of David that is fallen and repair its breaches and raise up its ruins and rebuild it as in the days of old, that they may possess the remnant of Edom and all the nations that are called by my name, declares the Lord who does this. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when the plowman shall overtake the reaper and the treader of grapes, him who sows the seed. The mountains shall drip sweet wine, and all the hills shall flow with it. I will restore the fortunes of my people Israel, and they shall rebuild the ruined cities and inhabit them, and they shall plant vineyards and drink their wine, and they shall make gardens and eat their fruit. I will plant them on the land, on their land, and they shall never again be uprooted out of the land that I have given them, says the Lord your God. What a powerful word for the nation of Israel. Amen. Now the plowman overtaking the reaper here and the treader of grapes, him who sows the seed, means, beloved, that the harvests of the earth are going to be so great that the workers of the field will not be able to keep up with it. Beloved, these are going to be the glory days of the earth. There will be no sickness nor disease during the millennium. People are going to walk in divine healing. As prophesied by Isaiah in Isaiah 33, 24, which states, and no inhabitant will say, I am sick. The millennial kingdom will reflect, beloved, all that God intended for the earth before the fall of Adam and Eve. Now let's go back to the book of Revelation chapter 20 and let's look at verses 4 and 5 again. Then I saw thrones, and seated on them were those to whom the authority to judge was committed. 
Also, I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for the testimony of Jesus and for the word of God, and those who had not worshipped the beast or its image and had not received its mark on their foreheads or their hands. They came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. This is the first resurrection. Now, church, we learned in chapter 19 of Revelation, when Jesus returns to the earth in order to establish his kingdom, he's going to return with the armies of heaven. And we learned that these armies include the bride of Christ, the martyred saints, and all of the angelic hosts. Now, the bride of Christ received her immortal body at the rapture of the church. All the martyred saints, which are depicted here as souls, both the tribulation saints and the faithful Old Testament saints, will be reunited with their resurrected bodies during what is called here the first resurrection. Together with the bride of Christ, these saints, beloved, will reign with Jesus over all the nations of the earth during the millennial reign. And these are they that John said he saw here in verse four on thrones to whom the authority to judge was committed. Now, Jesus promises those who overcome will rule and reign with him. Second Timothy chapter two, verse 12 tells the church, if we endure, we will also reign with him. And in Revelation chapter 3, verse 21, we learn that Jesus said, the one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. For the old faithful testament, for the faithful rather Old Testament saints, this was prophesied in Isaiah chapter 32, verse 1, which states, Behold, a king will reign in righteousness, and this is speaking of Jesus, and princes will rule with justice, and this is speaking of the faithful Old Testament saints. Now, it's during the millennial kingdom, the millennial reign of Christ, that all of this is going to take place. Those who rule and reign with Christ will take part in the first resurrection. Now, the book of Revelation makes a very clear distinction between what is called the first resurrection and the second resurrection. Everyone who ever lived will take part, beloved, in one of these two resurrections. The prophet Daniel refers to these two resurrections in Daniel chapter 12, verse 2, where he says, Many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and contempt. The millennial reign is that break between the first resurrection and the second, as we learn in verse 5 of Revelation chapter 20, which tells us this, the rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. Now, verse six goes on to say, blessed and holy is the one who shares in the first resurrection over such the second resurrection or rather the second death has no power, but they will be priests of God and of Christ and they will reign with him for a thousand years. Those who share in the first resurrection are blessed and holy. Beloved, the second death has no power over them. Well, what is the second death? The second death, church, is referring to the eternity spent in hell. Beloved, hell is a very real place. It is a place reserved for the wicked, whom the Bible describes as those who reject the mercy and grace of God that's been offered to us through the sacrifice of his son. It's called a second death because it's a death that comes after physical death. For all those who have died in their sin and rejected Christ, they will experience this second death. 
Later on in this chapter, verse 14 defines the second death as the lake of fire. It's a time of eternal torment. Take a look now at Revelation 20, verses 7 and 8. And when the thousand years are ended, Satan will be released from his prison and will come out to deceive the nations that are at the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them for battle. Their number is like the sand of the sea. Now, verse 7 here mentions once again that the enemy of our souls will be released from his prison, which is the bottomless pit, after the thousand years have ended. And verse 8 tells us that he will once again come out to deceive the nations. And his deception, beloved, will be so far-reaching, it says it will reach the four corners of the earth. In this verse, it mentions a battle that will take place at the end of the thousand years. And it mentions Gog and Magog. Now, this is not to be confused with the Gog and Magog war that is mentioned in the book of Ezekiel chapters 38 and 39. That war with Israel will take place during the tribulation period. The use of the names here is actually symbolic. They're used figuratively in Revelation chapter 20 to describe the enemies of God at the end of the millennium, saying here that they'll be likened to those who fought against God's people in the war that was described in Ezekiel chapter 38 and 39. Satan, in a final act of defiance to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, gathers the nations of the earth to turn again against the Lord. Now, verse 9. And they marched up over the broad plain of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints in the beloved city. But fire came down from heaven and consumed them. Church, just like the battle of Armageddon, this war is over before it even begins. Fire comes down from heaven and consumes these armies before they encroach upon the camp of the saints and of the city of God on the earth. The souls of those who are destroyed will go to a place called the place of the dead where they're going to await their final sentencing. Verse 10 tells us, and the devil who had deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur where the beast and the false prophet were and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Beloved, the final battle after the millennium will bring to an end the evil activity of Satan on the earth once and for all. He is now joined with the beast who is the Antichrist and the false prophet who have been in the lake of fire since the beginning of the millennial reign of Christ. There they will be tormented day and night forever. Now verses 11 through 15 of chapter 20 describe for us what will take place after the millennial reign of Christ on the earth. And it is the judgment before the great white throne. Now, this passage that we're about to read, beloved, is by far the saddest passage in all the book of the Bible. Beloved, this is God's final verdict on those who are lost in their sin, having rejected Christ and the mercy of God offered through him before they have been cast into the lake of fire. Now, John MacArthur in his book, Before the Time is Near, states that commonly known as the Great White Throne Judgment, it is the last courtroom scene that will ever take place. The accused, all of the unsaved that ever lived, will be resurrected to experience a trial like no other. There will be no debate over their guilt or innocence. There will be no 
pro there will be a prosecutor, but no defender, an accuser, but no advocate. There will be an indictment, but no defense mounted by the accused. The convicting evidence will be presented with no rebuttal or cross-examination. Beloved, this is a sobering passage, and it reveals the fate of those, all those, who refuse to repent of their sin and believe upon the one who took their sins on the cross. You know, I shared in a previous lesson, every one of us, everyone, every person who ever lives on this earth has one of two choices to make. We can either choose to accept Jesus Christ the Son of God who went to the cross to pay the penalty for our sin, or we can choose to pay the penalty for our sin ourselves. This is the choice that every person who ever lives on earth needs to confront, needs to make. Which one will you choose? There's still time to choose Jesus while there is still breath in our lungs, amen. Now let's take a look at Revelation chapter 20, verses 11 through 15. Once again, we'll read it through and then we'll look at the meaning verse by verse. Revelation chapter 20, verse 11. Then I saw a great white throne and him who was seated on it. From his presence, earth and sky fled away and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Then another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books according to what they had done. And the sea gave up the dead who were in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one of them, according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Okay, let's unpack the meaning of each one of these verses. Take a look again at verse 11. Then I saw a great white throne and him who was seated on it from his presence, earth and sky fled away and no place was found for them. Here, John sees a vision of the throne of God depicted as great and white. And it says here that the image uh, actually reveals God's sovereign authority being white, it's, it's a demonstration or, or a symbol of God's purity and his holiness. You see, beloved, this image shows us that God's righteous decrees are always right and always just. From his presence, earth and sky fled away and no place was found for them. This tells us that God's creation of the earth as we know it will be destroyed. Now, although built or rebuilt, I should say, during the millennium, the first heaven and the first earth will pass away as revealed to us in Revelation chapter 21, which we're going to study when we look at God's promise of a new heaven and a new earth in that chapter next week. And this is what verse 11 here is referring to, where John says, no place was found for them, speaking of the first heaven and the first earth. Now, the judgment of the heavens and the earth passing away can also be found in 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 10 through 13. So once again, I want you to hold your place here in Revelation, and let's turn for a moment to the epistle, 2 Peter, chapter 3, and we're going to be reading verses 10 through 13. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. 
Now, in verse 11, Peter goes on to tell us how we are to live in light of these things that are coming. Look at verse 11. Since all these things are thus to be dissolved, meaning the passing away of the heavens and the earth, what sort of people ought you be in lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn. But according to his promise, we are waiting for a new heaven and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Beloved, the apostle Peter admonishes us here that we are to live lives of holiness and godliness and waiting expectantly for the day of the Lord, for the day of the Lord's return. Beloved, we're called to live holy lives. You know, we don't hear enough about holiness these days. As a matter of fact, I could tell you, I heard a believer, many a believer say to me, it's impossible to live holy, so I don't even try. Well, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14, gives us a very good reason why we need to try why we need to strive to live holy. Take a listen to this, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14. It says here, strive for peace with everyone and for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Beloved, we are commanded by God to strive for holiness, not throw in the towel, Church, this is what God is telling us here. Through this, he's letting us know he's not looking for perfection, but he is looking for distinction. The word strive here shows us this is something we have to work after. We're commanded to live these holy lives, meaning we are called to live lives that are distinct, lives that are set apart for God. These are lives that stand up for what he stands up for and lives to endeavor to strive to obey his commands. You see, it's an attitude that says it's too hard to be holy. That's really secular and carnal in its thinking. You see, beloved, when you're truly born again of God's spirit, you don't try to live holy in your own strength and power. You live a life holy by depending upon his life living through you. You see, it's through his strength and his power, through the power of the Holy Spirit, that we are empowered to say no to sin and yes to righteousness. It's not a matter, beloved, of being hard. It is a matter of being willing. Willing to, number one, accept what God's word says about a matter. And number two, willing to be transformed to his will rather than conform to our will so that our behavior lines up with his will. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2 tells us that God's word is the power source to being transformed. Transformation, beloved, is the result of renewing our mind to the perfect will of God by receiving and then applying God's word to our life. Notice I said receiving and not reading. Now, do we need to read the word of God? Yes, absolutely. Every day, every day we should allow the word of God to be before our eyes. But I want you to know something. There are a lot of people who read the word, but don't receive the word. You see, you have to receive the word if you're going to be changed by the word. 
You have to settle in your mind that God's word is the truth on any given situation. And then you apply that truth to your own life. You see, beloved, God's word must become your final authority, not man's opinion, not the law of the land, not legislation, not the Congress, not the judiciary, not the president or the Senate, and certainly not your well-meaning friends. If what is spoken is contrary to the word of God. You see, beloved, the laws of the land might say it's legal, and your friends might even say it's okay. But if God says it's not, then it's not. Let's take a look at Revelation chapter 20, verse 12 again. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Then another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books according to what they had done. In this moment of time, between the destruction of the first heavens and the first earth and the coming of the new heaven and the new earth, John records here that he sees the dead, great and small, standing before the throne. Now, this massive gathering includes all the wicked dead from every generation since the beginning of mankind. And verse 12 goes on to say, books were opened. Then another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books according to what they had done. You see, because of their rejection of God's free gift of grace through Jesus Christ, all the wicked dead here have no other alternative but to pay the penalty for their sins themselves. They made that choice when they were living on the earth. Beloved, God keeps accurate records. His bookkeeping is impeccable. Recorded in his books are every deed ever done in the body while living on earth. When these records are open, God's sentencing commences. Those both great and small are already guilty of rejecting Christ. So they're now left with hearing their sentence based on their deeds. And the standard by which God measures a sinner's deeds, beloved, is God's holy law. His holiness and his righteousness sets the bar by which all else is measured. John tells us another book was opened, and that book is called the Book of Life. And this is the book in which all the names of the redeemed are written. And only those names that are written in the Book of Life will spend eternity in heaven. Take a look at verse 13. And the sea gave up the dead who were in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one of them, according to what they had done. Now the word sea here is actually a reference to the abyss. Death and Hades is referring to the place of the dead who since the time of their death have been imprisoned there waiting or awaiting their sentencing. The great white throne judgment takes place after the second resurrection and it precedes the second death, which is explained in the next verse, verse 14. You know, Revelation chapter 20, verse 6 proclaimed, blessed and holy is the one who shares in the first resurrection. Over such the second death has no power but they will be priests of God and of Christ and they will reign with him for a thousand years. Revelation chapter 20 verse 14 says, then death and Hades were thrown in the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And here we see that the temporary holding pen 
for the wicked dead. The place called Hades is now swallowed up in the lake of fire. For after the second resurrection, beloved, it has no future purpose. Verse 15. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. You know, the lake of fire is the final destination for all those who rejected Christ. It is where the devil, the antichrist and the false prophet and all those who are deceived by them will be punished forever and ever. Hebrews chapter nine, verse 27 tells us it is appointed for men to die once, but after this, the judgment. Beloved, the Bible is clear. Judgment day will come. And the only opportunity to make a decision for Christ is while we're still alive because it is appointed for men to die once, but after this, the judgment. The choice to receive God's sacrifice for our sins through his son is ours alone to make. The choice to follow and obey Christ is ours alone to make. No one can make that choice for you. Jesus said in John chapter 14, verse 15, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. And he said in Luke chapter 11, verse 28, blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it. You know, Jesus also says something in Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 to 23, that is very jarring. He says in this passage, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me you workers of lawlessness. As I said, beloved, these words of Jesus are jarring. They should cause us to pause and ser seriously consider where do we truly stand with Christ? Are we who we profess to be? In answering the question, how do I know if I'm saved? Dr. Billy Graham responded, someone might say, I believe the historic facts of the gospel, but nothing has changed for me. I don't think I'm saved. He went on to say, perhaps you're not. For the faith that saves has one distinguishing quality Saving faith is a faith that produces obedience. It is a faith that brings about a way of life. Some have successfully imitated this way of life for a time, but for those who trust Christ for salvation, that faith brings about a desire to live out that inward experience of faith. It is a power that results in godly living. Beloved, true salvation brings about change, a change that begins in the heart and affects all of our choices and decisions, our behaviors and our motives. That change is the result of the new birth. God, through the prophet Ezekiel, said this, speaking of the new birth, 
Verse 26, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will remove your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh and I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and to carefully observe my ordinances. Here we see God's promise to not only give us new life, but give us the power to live it. Jesus said this about the new birth. No one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. To be born again, beloved, is to be born of God's spirit. And he offers this gift to those who upon hearing the gospel repent of their sins and put their faith and trust in his son and in his son alone for their salvation. Simply put, the gospel is this. Christ has died. He died for your sins and mine. Christ is risen. On the third day, Jesus rose from the dead and is now seated at the right hand of the Father. And Christ, beloved, will come again. When the last trumpet sounds, Jesus will come again, first to take his bride away, and then he will come to judge the living and the dead. Make the decision to receive Jesus Christ now before the first resurrection. Let's pray together and let's ask God, let's pray in a way he taught us. Jesus said that while we're on earth, we need to pray that we would be counted worthy to escape these things that will come upon the earth. I want us to pray together tonight, but really mean it from your hearts. And so just put aside all the distractions, whatever it is you might have to silence right now, or maybe you have to separate yourself and go into a private room. Let's take this moment to truly pray from our hearts that we would be counted worthy to escape these things coming upon the earth. And beloved, the way to be counted worthy, to escape the lake of fire, to escape the white throne judgment is to be in the first resurrection, amen? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before your throne right now. Lord, we know we just read a very sobering word and our hearts, oh God, are, are turned toward you in this moment. And we pray for the Holy Spirit to give that grace to everyone who's hearing. Turn our hearts toward you. Almighty God and King, we surrender all that we have and all that we are to you, to your Lordship. We recognize you are the Christ, the one sent by God the one sent to deliver us from all evil, to deliver us from the destruction that will come upon the earth. You, Lord God, gave us the promise of a new heaven and a new earth. You promised to take us to where you are. So right now, Lord God, we lift up our hands, we lift up our hearts, we lift up our voice, make us, prepare us, ready us and steady us that we may hear when the trumpet sounds. That we may be counted worthy, Lord, to be in that first resurrection. Oh God, we pray for one another right now. Let your Holy Spirit fall fresh upon us. We ask you, Lord, to be ever present with us. You promised in your word, you would be a very present help in time of trouble. Lord, our earth is in trouble. We need you. 
We need your presence in this hour, in this moment to equip us so that we will be able to endure unto the end. For you promised those who endure to the end would be seated with you on your throne. Oh God, that not one would be lost in the sound of my voice. Father God, I pray right now that the mercy and grace of God you bestowed upon your children would fall upon us and fall upon those watching, Lord God. Draw them to yourself. Make us what we ought to be. Equip us with every gift we need from heaven above to stand strong in this hour, to be bold, to stand up for truth, to declare your righteousness and not be ashamed of the gospel. For we know, God, that the gospel is the power of God until salvation, unto salvation. Oh God, we just thank you for our salvation. Cry out to him and thank him for saving you. Ask him to save you if you, you don't have that confidence of salvation. Know that he is your confidence tonight. Salvation comes by him. He is the way, the truth, and the life, beloved. Cry out to Jesus. Jesus, we yearn for you. Holy Spirit, come and fill us. Fill our hearts and fill us, fill our minds with the knowledge of you. And we ask this through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Well, God bless you, beloved. I'm so glad you joined us this evening for another uh, session of this series. You know, if you've missed any of the teachings, please follow the links that are provided for you in this video description. We're so grateful that each and every one of you have been with us probably from the beginning. So many of you have been with us from the beginning of this series, and I pray that it has been empowering you and equipping you for the times that we're living in right now. For those of you who have given online, I just wanna thank you. Pastor Gary, myself, and all of the church family here, we thank you for your generous support to this ministry, your online giving and your checks that you've been sending to our church have sustained us and, and taken us through this very difficult season that we all find ourselves in. And so we're so grateful for your generosity and your faithfulness to the Lord and his work through this church. If you'd like to give tonight, we just encourage you, please follow the link that's provided below. And we would want you to know how much we appreciate every gift that you sow into this ministry. We're so grateful for you, beloved. Don't forget to join us next week. Uh, we're winding down, as I said. We're coming toward the conclusion. Only two more weeks left for the bu book of Revelation, and it's going to be a powerful conclusion to the book. So I want to encourage you to join us next week at 730 right here on Facebook or our YouTube page. And don't forget Sunday service with Pastor Gary at 10 a.m., Children's Church at 920, also right here through our live stream. We're so grateful for you joining with us each and every week. Join us throughout the week with our life groups. Uh, contact us and we'll find something that you could plug into even during this quarantine so that you are being fed, you are being encouraged, and you are being strengthened in your walk with the Lord. God bless you, beloved. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. I'm looking forward to meeting you again next week. Good night. God bless. <laughs>